the whole hematopoietic process starts from the hematopoietic stem cell, which has to renew itself to form a reservoir of stem cells or to commit and differentiate to the lymphoid and myelin lineages. You have heard a lot about the lymphoid lineage. I'm going to focus now on the myelin lineage. Once this commitment occurs, then these progenitors are born to die unless cytokines bind to their receptors to induce survival, proliferation, and differentiation. And then the final numbers of red blood cells, platelets, granulocytes, and monocytes are a direct reflection of the levels of cytokines. And those cytokines bind to surface receptors such as the erythropoietin <laughs> receptor for erythropoietin, which exists at the surface of erythroid progenitors. And these receptors are usually loosely associated dimers that are completely inactive in the absence of stimulus. <coughs> and they are bound to enzymes, which we'll call JACs, James kinases, or just another kinases, that are actually necessary to bring these receptors to the cell surface. And then once the ligand binds, they will transmit the signal. So this complex is completely inactive, unlike, for example, G-protein coupled receptors, which have a basal activity. And when the ligand binds, there is a conformational change in the receptor transmitted to the transmembrane domain, and the two jack proteins cross-phosphorylate each other at diverse residues, and that activates their enzymatic activity, then that leads to phosphorylation of the receptor. And tyrosines in the receptor, now phosphorylated, recruit signaling proteins such as STATs, signal transducers and activators of transcription, which are now close enough to the kinase to be phosphorylated themselves, and that leads to their dimerization and translocation into the nucleus where they bound to consensus sites in promoters of genes. And that's how the jack stack pathway regulates transcription. Now, in addition to this pathway, cytokine receptors such as the thrombopoietin receptor also activates the pathways activated by growth factors such as insulin. For example, the PI3 kinase, AKT and TOR pathway and the sheep rasp MEP kinase pathway. And all those signals are decoded at the nucleus to induce survival, proliferation and differentiation. Now, as opposed to the EPO receptor, which is really erythroid specific, the thrombopoietin receptor is expressed from the hematopoietic stem cell through the metakaryocytes. It's required for metakaryocyte differentiation and it's also present on platelets. So it's a receptor that accompanies the entire hematopoiesis. Now, there is a group of diseases which we focus on, which are called myeloproliferative neoplasms. They have been grouped together by Professor William Damaschek in the 50s. And they are the polycythemia rubra vera, where you have a very high level of red blood cell production, essential thrombocytemia, where there is a high level of platelet production, and a very severe condition, primary myelofibrosis, where the malignant proliferation of myeloid progenitors leads to fibrosis of the marrow and extramedullary hematopoiesis. Some patients start as essential thrombocytemia and need evolved to polycythemia vera and finally myelofibrosis, in that case is secondary myelofibrosis. Some go directly from EV to myelofibrosis, some are de novo EV or myelofibrosis, and, and these diseases together are five times more prevalent than the chronic myelogenous leukemia, which is induced by this urable, and which is also a member of this myeloproliferative cancers. In polycythemia vera, if we look at the peripheral blood, we see a dramatic increase in hematocrit. And this by itself will lead to severe complications, such as vascular complications, stroke, <coughs> and so these patients must be treated in order to avoid those complications. In the case of myelofibrosis, this, the disease is quite severe. It can lead to evolution to acute leukemia or to pancytopenia, and that, of course, is very severe for the patient. Now, how did we get involved in searching for a cause for this myeloproliferative neoplasms? It all started from work we have done on the synthesis of the thrombopoietin and erythropoietin receptors. And what we noticed is that if we have a cell line that expresses the thrombopoietin receptor and we treat this cell line with an inhibitor of protein synthesis, you can see that after five or seven hours, the 
the receptor is now degraded, so the half-life is around here. And if we overexpress JAK2 or another JAK TIC2 that binds to this receptor, the receptor is stabilized. So the complex of JAKs with receptors are, is much more stable. And when we got this result, we remember that in 1999, Professor Jerry Spivak in Johns Hopkins University has actually reported that Olisetimia vera and fibrosis patients have a defect in the stability of the thrombopoietin receptor. This receptor was in diminished amounts in platelets and it was immature. You see here a doublet and that lower band actually is sensitive to glycosidase which diagnoses it as an immature glycosylation. On the other hand, we were seeing that with JAK2 and TIC2 this receptor was more stable. Since JAK2 was the main JAK involved in signaling, our group postulated that the defect in JAK2 must be involved in these diseases. And to continue on that, we collaborated with Professor William Banschenker um, at the Institut Gustave Roussy in Paris, who had a large collection of these polycythemia vera patients, and the plan was to express libraries from these patients and try to study the receptor traffic. But the first experiment that was done was a controlled sequencing of JAK2 in polycythemia vera, although this has been done before and reported to be intact. And what came out of that was that most of the patients had a mutation, GTC to TTC, GTC codes for valin, TTC codes for phenylalanin, in a certain domain which we call pseudokinase domain of JAK2. And we could see it in erythroid cells, in peripheral blood granulocytes, so it was not necessary to make a bone marrow biopsy, you could see it in peripheral blood, but not in T cells. And that is because T cells have very long lives and one needs many, many years of evolution to get a stem cell to, to go to the T <coughs> cell. And that brings me to the structure of this group of enzymes, James kinases, initially discovered and called just another kinase by Andrew Wills in Australia, because the function was, was not known, but then it was clear that there are four of these enzymes that are crucial for more than 30 cytokine receptors, including interferon, and then the name was changed to Janus, because Janus is the Roman god of opening doors, so open signaling by these receptors. It also has, has a head with two phases, and this is a metaphor for the fact that this protein has a tyrosine kinase domain, but also a pseudokinase domain that resembles the kinase domain but doesn't have full activity. And then on the amino terminal side, we and others have shown that this part binds to cytokine receptors, and that is how cytokine receptors couple to these jacks. So the mutation was actually in the pseudokinase domain, and somehow this leads to activation of the kinase domain. And so Judith Stark in my lab has made the first cDNA of this V617F mutant and showed that cells that normally should not grow, hematopoietic cells in the absence of cytokines, such as IL-3 or EBO, now did grow. So it was a constitutive signaling, proliferative signaling. And then in Western blood experiments, one can see that normally phosphorylation of JAK, of STAT5, of AKT, and ERK are dependent on the plus EPO condition, while in the presence of the mutant, everything was constitutive active. So this was an active enzyme that actually replaced the, the cytokine binding step. And we also have shown in that experiment that if we transform cells by V617F, for example, pro B cells, and those cells are now growing in the absence of interleukin, if we overexpress wild type JAK2, that can really diminish the proliferation. So you go from full proliferation to much less by overexpressing the wild type wild-type enzyme. And that led to the notion that there must be some limiting factor in the cell for which the wild-type and the mutant compete, and that is why homozygous patients, of course, proliferate more their cells than the heterozygous patients. So that led to a diagnostic test that is now performed, a little specific PCR or sequencing, and now uh, Tachman qPCR. So most of these patients are tested in hospitals all over the place for the JAK2 V617F mutation. In the case of, of the, the mechanism, what, what we think happens is that, in fact, these receptors now become constitutively <coughs> active because they are bound to this mutant jack, and there is no longer the need for ligand. And that is why these patients have, for example, low EPO in their serum, and that is a, a useful diagnostic criteria. So 
not only our labs, but also the lab of Tony Green, Brad Skoda, and Alexander Vanucki have done extensive studies, and now it's clear that more than 98% of polycythemia vera have this mutant, which is a quite unique and somatic. And then 50% of these two other diseases are associated with this mutation. So one major question, of course, is why one patient with this mutation develops polycythemia vera and the other one develops essential thrombocytemia. And then they're not present in the other types of diseases. So that is really an important question because clearly one would expect that both lineages and also the granulocytic lineage should go up in these patients. In some patients that do, but most of the patients are either PV or ET patients. And, and so this is a very important question that many labs uh, are studying now. I'm going to try to show you what we're doing on this. But before that, I want to say that this identification of JAK2B617F led to an effort by the industry to produce JAK2 inhibitors and to use them in the treatment of myeloperifative neoplasms. And I think there are at least 10 molecules in clinical trials. And the first one, the inside compound now in Novartis, has been approved by FDA and the NDA and is now approved for myelofibrosis treatment. And what happens is this molecule binds to the kinase domain of JAK2 and competes with ATP. So it equally blocks the wild-type mutant, the wild-type JAK2, and the mutant JAK2. And in these trials, it had very good effects on decreasing spleen size and myelofibrosis, improving quality of life, decreasing inflammatory symptoms. So for the patient, it's much better. But unfortunately, it does not cure the disease. <coughs> the fibrosis is not reversed in the marrow, the mutant allele burden is not diminished, and the blaster is still in the periphery. So unlike imatinib in bcr able JAK2 inhibitors have not reached the ability to cure these diseases or to really dramatically treat them. And I think that there are two explanations for this. One is that the inhibitor is non-specific, so if we go up in amounts and doses, it will be toxic for the normal red blood cell formation and platelet formation. And a lot of patients have to drop out because of anemia and thrombocytopenia. And of course, the second possibility is that there are other events preceding JAK2 that have to be addressed as well. So we in the lab have worked quite hard on the, on the mechanism of activation by, by this mutation. And what we have seen that is that not only phenylalanine activates JAK2 in transcriptional assays here on step 5, but also tryptophan does, isoleucine, leucine, and methionine. So, so there are four mutants that can activate at that position, and most of the patients have V617F, but recently some myelofibrosis patients have been identified with this mutation, and one germline mutation in ET has been published recently in New England Journal of Medicine. Now, the tryptophan mutation is very strong. So you see here an experiment we did in mice, and this is the hematocrit. After 45 days, it's, it's quite high. We have a picture of myelofibrosis in the marrow with, with megakaryocyte clusters, with erythroblast, and if we would color it for reticular, you would see. But we'd never see this mutation in patients because we would need to change three bases to do it, while isoleucine and leucine, like phenylalanine, it's one base change. To get to a better way of understanding this mutation, Alexandra Dusha in the lab has actually modeled the pseudokinase domain at a time when there was no structure on the structure of some closely related kinases. Because I should say that those two kinase domains are not duplications. They are, have different origins in evolution. And so what she asked is which is the closest position in those structures to the position mutated in JAK2. And what she found is that there is a phenylalanine in a helix just above that is predicted to make actually contact with this phenylalanine 617. And so to test that, she mutated that phenylalanine in the context of V617F to a lot of residues. And you can see that most mutations kill the activity of the V617F, except mutations that have aromatic residues. So that led to the conclusion that we need an aromatic interaction between the V2F and the F595. And then she went ahead and showed that these double mutants that are no longer active, you see the difference between a constitutive active and this double mutant, they still respond to erythropoietin. So if we have a receptor and Leiden, they are able to respond 
normally. So that means that we can uncouple the response to cytokine, which is physiologic, from the activation by this mutation, which is pathologic. And so the model was that this mutation changes the structure of the pseudokinase domain around this helix, and that is transmitted to activate the kinase domain persistently. And so a few weeks ago, the lab of Steve Hubbard has published the first crystal structure of the pseudokinase domain in isolation, either with or without the V617F mutation, and they have actually uh, described that, in fact, there is an aromatic interaction between the F617 and the F595, which we have predicted, but they described two additional things that we didn't. One was that helix C was much longer if you have this interaction, so there's a secondary structure change, and that there is another phenylalanine that rotates and comes and forms a three-ring structure. So this leads to the fact that probably this is a, a pocket for small molecule inhibition that could address specifically this mutant. We asked whether this mechanism would be true for other jacks, and so Judith Stark has shown that Jack 1 and Tick 2, the other two jacks, can be also activated if a phenylalanine is placed at this position. So you see here grows in the absence of light in the hematopoietic cells for both. But the JAK3, who does not have a valent metathionine, is not activated by this mutant. So we then asked, is for JAK1, the equivalent of V2F, also important the homologous F595? And the answer is yes. So at least for JAK1 and probably TIC2, this mechanism is the same. And then we went on the other side, JAK3, which you see is not active when we put the phenylalanine at 617, but then we put the phenylalanine at 595, so we restore the, the, the pair, and then the JAK3 is now strongly active with this double mutant. So basically, a pseudokinase domain where we remake this FF pair can activate the kinase domain. So the hope now is that targeting this pocket by small molecules would uncouple this interaction and then would allow a block of the mutant jack and sparing the wild type jack. And to conclude, these are constitutive active jacks in uh, combination with, uh, with receptors and, and they might offer the possibility to, to have a way to inhibit them. Now, in a separate project, the same student had looked at the structure of the transmembrane domain of the thrombopoietin receptor. Because we noticed that if we align all the cytokine receptors, growth hormone, leptin, thrombopoietin, and so on, and this is the outset of the cytoplasmic domain, we noticed that the thrombopoietin receptor had an extra insert of five amino acids that was not present in any of the other receptors. So, we ask the simple question, is this insert necessary for the receptor? And the answer was yes, because in the absence of it, we created a receptor called Delta-5, and if we put this receptor in mice in bone marrow reconstitution experiments, then you see thrombocytosis and leukocytosis after reconstitution, suggesting that this receptor is now a constitutive active receptor. So those five amino acids, when we mutated them one by one, lead to the conclusion that in the absence of the tryptophan and the first residue, the receptors were active. So these five residues are required to maintain the receptor inactive in the absence of lignin. And Jean-Philippe Dufour in the lab has made an extensive study on the structural level of this, and it looks like you cannot replace this tryptophan with any other residue, because any other residue, including tyrosine and phenylalanine, which are closely related, and others, lead to strong activation. And so, also on the biophysical stage, we look by analytical ultracentrifugation at the transmembrane, juxtamembrane domain oligomerization, and you see that the normal receptor is likely to be like a monomer in this assays, but if you delete this, it runs as a dimer, and the same thing happens if you mutate the tryptophan to the lysine. So we think that these mutations really promote dimerization of the receptor, and with this occasion, we could see that the tryptophan and the transmembrane cytosol cytosolic junctions can modulate dimerization of the upstream helix in the membrane. And that might have a more general biochemical implication because a lot of proteins 
that have membrane domains have tryptophans at the border with the cytoplasmic domain. And it might be that those tryptophans are not there just to anchor, but also to prevent dimerization of the helices. So once we have reported those data, several groups have sequenced thromboploitin receptor in myeloproliferative diseases that didn't have JAK2 mutation. And it was really interesting to see that the, the group of uh, Bardanani and Teferi, then Gilliland, and then ourselves, we found mutations in this tryptophan in those patients. The first mutation was leucine, then lysine, then we reported alanine mutation, and now there are many others. So, 5 to 8% of these patients that do not have jak 2 b 617 f have actually mutations at thrombopoietin residue 515. So we compared in vivo the potencies of those two mutations. And you can see here that the point mutant thrombopoietin receptor induces a dramatic effect. This is 45 days post-reconstitution. We have here huge spleens that develop. And already at this stage, there is spleen fibrosis and myelofibrosis. And that is much faster than the jak 2 v 617 f type of, of mutation. And by mass spectrometry, we could see that two tyrosine residues were phosphorylated in this mutant receptor in cells. And to make a long story short, one of them is absolutely crucial for phenotype. Because if you mutate this tyrosine to a related phenylalanine that cannot be phosphorylated, we lose the phenotype. So this is the spleen fibrosis induced by mutant receptors. And you see that if you mutate this tyrosine, there is no phenotype anymore. So we believe that a small molecule or some kind of treatment that will block this tail of the receptor, which is not absolutely required for normal function, would prevent myelofibrosis induction in this mutant receptor, and possibly also in the case of wild-type receptor coupled with JAK2 B617. So the second project that was actually started as a structural project had no intention to be linked to any kind of hematology application, fortunately led to this identification of novel mutations that activate thrombopoietin receptor in the absence of thrombopoietin and it leads to rapid myeloproliferative disease. So again, this led us to postulate that choice of receptors by the JAKs, by the JAK mutant, might be very important in expanding one or the other of the lineages and that high level of thrombopoietin receptor signaling might actually promote myelofibrosis. And, and that might, of course, be due to the fact that different patients have different polymorphisms in different interactors of this pathway, which would favor one or the other of, of the pathways, but also that perhaps the signaling by, by these receptors must somehow listen to the strength of the JAK2 signaling, and it looks like at low level we get ET, at medium level we get EV, and at very high level we we, we, we do get myelofibrosis. So I started this presentation with the downregulation of this receptor in the disease patients. We could reproduce that by co-expressing jak 2 b 2 f with the receptor. It's a protein destruction phenomenon, not a message downregulation, and it's, that it's done by, um, by ubiquitination. And if we use jak 2 v 617 f knocking mice, and treat them with JAK2 inhibitors, we can recover the expression of receptor in platelets, therefore defining this as a biomarker somehow of, of treatment. And that also happens in patients treated for six months. This is one of the patients we have from Laurent Plus in Sandwich Hospital. After six months of JAK2 inhibitor, he restored the thrombopoietin receptor on the surface. So up to now, I've convinced you that these are simple diseases that you have a constitutive activation of JAKs and receptors that replace cytokines and that leads to excessive production of differentiated cells. But the nature of the signal is not really good for the cells because it's a persistent signal. So for example, when you have STAT5 activation, this is usually a transient phenomenon. While here, in the case of a persistently activated JAK, we will have the JAK binding the STAT to its normal targets, but also to new targets low affinity targets in the genome, and when that happens, you will induce new genes that are not normally induced in hematopoiesis that might lead to progression of the disease. And so there is now a link made between the persistent signaling of JAKs to epigenetic regulators such as uh, arginine methyltransferases and histones, 
and also the discovery of mutations in epigenetic regulators like, such as polycomb uh, proteins or enzymes that <coughs> hydroxylate methyl DNA. And that leads to an explanation to why some of these patients, not all, a minority of them, evolve to complicated diseases and to acute myeloid leukemia. And you can see here that while 80% of those have JAK2 and MPL mutations, then the rest have all these other mutations, and some of them overlap with myeloid dysplasia and acute myeloid leukemia. So it's going to be very important in the future to, to test for all those things and then subclassify the MPD patients into those that are really only JAK driven and receptor driven from those where they have other events that are common to myeloid dysplasia and leukemia and they also acquire on them JAK and MPL mutations to drive proliferation. And so that is what will happen when a stem cell will continue to feed into this lineage and one day a more advanced progenitor like a CFU GM will transform and that will lead to blast proliferation and a stop in differentiation. And there is now a big overlap between severe myelofibrosis and myelodysplasia where we have a block in differentiation and acute leukemia where we also have extensive uh, proliferation. So I'm going to conclude with this perspective slide. What are now the, the key things that uh, we're going to try to, to do is to go after the rest of this, 40% that don't have yet a known molecular cause. Um, and we have some of, we identified some markers where we could subclassify them and perhaps go better for sequencing. There are families that in a sort of fascinating way acquire jak 2 v 617 m during their life and get disease. But they do not have it in the germline. So there must be genes that are mutated and that predispose to systematic acquisition of this mutation, to isolate inhibitors that specifically act on mutated proteins and on wild type, and then understand much better how thrombopoietin regulates stem cells and metacardiocyte differentiation and how the choice of stats really leads to, to, this, uh, to this process. So I'm going to acknowledge members of my group. I've already spoken about Judith Stark, who has been essential for this project, Christian Fiquet, Alexandra Dusha, Jean-Philippe Dufour. I would like to thank our collaborator, William Manchenker, in Institute of Staff Russie, and Stephen Smith in Stony Brook for, for structural studies. Uh, I'd like to thank our own university and hospital for um, a network of hematology research, um, and members of the group of ETC in Singapore for help with screening for small molecules.